Cheers. Lisa Gollum here from Rock Studio, and we're going to do another Tutorial Thursday for you. Ha! You're not going to do one of those stupid paintings, are you? You know, with all those lines and squiggles? This is what we're painting today. Well, that's better than most of them. Ha! Still think you're wasting your time with this art crap. Oh, Mona. Say goodbye, Mona. Bye! <sighs> that woman, I tell you, <laughs> she'd drive anybody to drink. Oh, cheers again. Okay, time to get to our tutorial. Okay, first we need a flat brush. One inch or even bigger is fine. And we need some paint, blue, white, and magenta or red and a palette knife. First, we're gonna mix a light blue, which is mostly white with a tiny bit of blue. Then we're gonna add a little magenta to part of that light blue. First, we're going to add white on the middle of the canvas, kind of straight down the middle with side to side strokes. Then we're gonna add some of that nice light purple, sort of around that, also overlapping into it to make a nice blend. Then you're going to add some of the blue on the top, some on the sides. And then at the end, we're going to add some white just to make it pop on the sides where the snow is going to be, just for fun. Okay, and now using a knife, we are going to define where our horizon is going to be. Now, we never want it halfway up the canvas. We want it either a little below halfway or a little above. In this case, I went a little above. You can do whatever you like. And I use a knife because a knife has a very nice straight edge. Okay, now we're mixing a medium blue. We put a little magenta in there just for fun. Purpleize it a little bit. And then we're adding a little black. And black is great because it grays it down just a touch. Makes it a little more of a natural hue. Then we're gonna mix another medium blue that's similar but without the black because we want two different shades of blue. We're gonna create our icy stream. Okay, so starting wherever you want the focal point in the painting to kind of go, wherever you want the eye to land. Probably not, again, dead center in the center of the two sides, but a little off one way or the other. And then I go down and I use side to side strokes, making sure you zigzag and you zig and then you zag again and you just kind of have fun with it. You don't want it to come straight down in a V because that's kind of boring. So it's meandering like a stream does because it's a stream. <laughs> I like to meander. I don't know about you. Meandering's fun. So I didn't zig and zag too awfully much, but a little bit, kind of zig and zag. Now I'm adding, I added, that was the, the, uh, grayed down blue and now I'm adding some of the medium brighter blue without the black in it just to bring a difference in tone in the string. Ah, so good. Then we're going to add white to brighten in areas and make it look icy. And of course the white's going to blend with the blues underneath.
Now we get to do the snow. Because we all love snow. It makes us think of Christmas. So the key to this is to really load Mama Bear. To take that Mama Bear brush, get it really almost like clumps of white paint on it, and really generously set that down. Let the textures happen. The line, think of snowdrifts, you know, rounded shapes, and make sure some snowdrifts jut sort of into the stream, making sort of round shapes, like sideways M's. Um, and that just kind of helps the perspective, make it look like it's going back. Also, it's always good to make the bottom parts of the snowdrift kind of flatter because it makes it like look like it's going back just a little more. Now we're adding some watery purple for shading. Now, I mixed a fair bit of water because I didn't want to obliterate the white snowdrifts. I just wanted to sort of make subtle little changes. So like that paint is probably 60% water. And I rub it a bit with my fingers to rub it in a bit. And I'm doing the same with blue. Make it your own, have fun with this. Just because snow takes on the reflections of the things around, similar to water, not quite as much as water does, but still there's lots of shadows and different light reflections in the snow. Otherwise, it looks really fake if you just paint white. Not only that, it's kind of boring. You know I'm boring. Ever. You never, never, never want your paintings to look boring, right? <laughs> I know I don't. All right. So now that I did that, it looked a little extreme. So, you know, white is our friend always. It like, And I'm just sort of putting a thin layer of white. I didn't put water in with this white but I'm just adding more of a thin layer just to sort of blend and amalgamate those colors in the snow to make them a little more subtle, because subtlety is good. we take baby bear and I'm mixing a little bit of gray and it's a purpley gray so I took whatever I had of the purple and just added a little bit extra black to it and that grayed it down and I'm using a very light touch the lighter you push on baby bear the, the finer the line and these trees are really in the distance so they are grayed down that's why we're using gray and they're small so they're only you know, on the canvas, they're a couple inches tall, a little more maybe, but not any much more than that. Making sure too that where they grow out of the ground isn't all in a straight line. They're, we're varying where they're growing so that it looks a little more organic. I'm fussing with little branches. If you just wanna make like one, branch, one trunk and maybe one you know, other branch coming out of the trunk and stop, that is perfectly fine. If you're a beginner, that is fine. It will still look good. These are not the focus of your painting. These are just there to kind of create the illusion of distance and, and sort of things going back in space. I'm starting to have fun with those little wispy branches in the background. It's also a really good hint to see how I got my pinky up there sort of to put that pinky to anchor yourself on the painting because then you can use baby bear almost more like a pencil and you're just letting those little hairs on the end of that brush just skim across that canvas where the ends of those branches are. Are you having fun yet? I hope you are. I also find painting not just, just not just fun. Painting is also very meditative for me and very peaceful. Um, if you let go of that perfectionism and just give it your best shot and have fun with it, it can be so relaxing. And um, it's always good in this day, especially with all the things that are happening in the world right now. It's great to have something that helps you relax. 
Now I'm making shadows. So what I've done is I've added two or three or four baby bearfuls of water into that gray, making sure I wipe my brush off on the paper towel a little bit. So I don't overload my brush, just having a little bit of that watery gray. And then I'm just putting some shadows. They can go where, wherever you think the light source is. They can go straight down, which I find a little boring. They can go on an angle this way or they can go the other way. It's the, only, the only important part is that they all go the same direction because your sun isn't going to be in this place for one tree and over here for another tree. That would be really weird. That would be a, like a surrealistic painting. Ah, now we're starting with the black. Trees in the foreground, or more in the foreground. They're not quite in the very front, but they're close. You can do whatever you want, but keep in mind where you want the lamppost to live in the painting. Having said that, if you find the lamppost, which is kind of the most challenging part of this painting, if you think it's kind of hard and you don't want to put it in there, or you just don't like the look of it, feel free to not include it. You can just have the stream and the trees and it's a perfectly beautiful painting without the lamppost. But at this point, what I am thinking about is where is my lamppost going to live in space? And I decided to put it on the left. You can put it on the right if you want. But I think about where it's going to live and then I'm kind of leaving space for it. Now it's in the very foreground, so that's why it's getting painted last. Typically, when we paint, we paint from the back towards the front. Because then, of course, everything you paint is going to be in front of the last thing you painted, which makes sense. I'm just doing the bottom of my trunks first so I get a sense of where I want the trees to live in space. And making sure that the trunks start in various points of time. And the further back they are in the painting, the smaller typically they are. I decided to arc some of my branches over the frozen stream because that just looks kind of cool. You don't have to do that if you don't want. And again, you can do a lot less branches than I'm doing. I've painted trees a lot. So I tend to go a little overboard with branches, but you don't have to do that. One thing I didn't say, I didn't talk about drying times. Sometimes between steps in a painting, it's good to dry. You can use a blow dryer for that. For example, if that white snow was wet, it would make it really hard for you to paint the trees without getting, you know, white paint all over your sleeve or all over your arm.
having fun designing my tree branches. I find naked trees, I call them naked trees, because I'm weird. You know that about me, right? <laughs> okay, but they're naked branches because they have no leaves. So I find leaveless trees just interesting. They, 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 can just, they just move and they create lines. They're really cool in a painting. And yeah, you could put, wow, this is a winter painting, so you wouldn't put leaves on these maple trees or whatever they are. But in a normal painting where you do put leaves on, I find they're just kind of like sit there. And they're, they're not as interesting to me somehow as when they're naked trees. I don't like other things naked. Well, for sure, I like trees naked. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Stop it at, and leave it at that. See, watching me paint actually is almost more meditative than actually when I'm painting. Hmm. Especially realism. I, I actually find it harder to paint realism and be meditative. When I paint abstract, I just let go and I usually don't plan anything beyond what techniques I might try to use in this particular painting. And that's usually all I plan. And I just go for it and have fun. When there's an agenda that it's supposed to look like something when it's finished, sometimes that can be a little more pressure. But I really encourage you to just not accept that and just say, hey, Mona, because <laughs> Mona's my negative Nancy, my, my naysaying voice that criticizes everything I do. Um, I put her to sleep. She's gone. <laughs> um, but yeah, you don't want to let them take over. You just want to um, express yourself and try. And every painting you do will be better than the one before. And that's how we learn. Sometimes I find in our Western culture, we're not good at learning. We're, we think that we should be good at something the first time we try. And if we're not, we get ticked off at ourselves and we don't try again. And that's so sad because then you never get really good at it and you never get to the point where you can relax into it and really feel the joy of it. That's my two cents worth. So, you know, like we did with the background trees, if you didn't notice already, we're doing the foreground trees, shadows. So now we're taking our knife and we're using it, the palette knife, to kind of help us design the post of the lamp. The lamp post? I guess that's how you would actually say it. So if you haven't noticed yet, there's so many ways to cheat when you paint, but don't tell anybody I told you. Shh. If you use Either a putty knife, putty knife is just the blade's a little longer, but any blade of any knife, any palette knife, any putty knife, will give you a nice straight line just to set it down and pull it back off. And that's a good way to cheat, to give yourself the, line, the straight line to kind of guide you when you're painting something that's supposed to be straight. If you don't have a knife, you, do, you can use a ruler. I actually have a ruler where I can paint the edge of the ruler and just set it down. Um, or you can use a ruler to hold it on the painting and paint alongside of it, if you like it that. Try and experiment with different ways to make a straight line. And now I'm creating bottom of the post. This can look any way you want. Hey, you can literally Google image for posts, for lamp posts, and see which design you like and try and paint that. That's fine. This is just what I happen to design in my mind. Busy place up there. <laughs> I'm glad Mona's a sleeper. She would have had a field day with that one. <laughs> Let me know in the comments, by the way, if you're enjoying Mona. I'm enjoying the crap out of 
having fun with her. And sometimes it's good to have an external concrete thing to, to sort of represent that negative voice in your mind that, that sort of tells you you're full of crap and you shouldn't be trying because you suck at everything. Like to have an external manifestation of that voice is kind of cool because then you can like argue against it and it gives you a focus and helps you sort of defeat it. So. By the way, when you're doing finer detail, like, like designing the lamp post top, you would use baby bear. Now I'm using Papa Bear because I wanted, because it has a nice square edge for doing the, those glass panes in the lamp. Now, um, it's a little bit big for the size of that lamp post, um, but I was just, honestly, I was too lazy to go get a smaller brush, but you can get smaller brushes that are flat as well and square. But yeah, if you try to do it with a round brush, the lines would be all over the place and they wouldn't be straight in any one direction. So this is a good way to do it. So now we mix a light yellow, which is of course obviously white and yellow mixed together. And then I put a little bit more of a dramatic yellow. And then I looked at it and I decided because there's no yellow anywhere else in the painting, I didn't want it quite so drastic. So then I added more white back in. So again, you let the painting tell you what it needs and let it dictate what you should be doing with it. I swear my paintings talk to me. They do. Yeah. Once you get the yellow and the whites in the balance you like, and it looks a little bit like glass paint to you, then you can do the bars around those lampshade glasses. Remembering though that we're seeing two angles of that light and so it would be meeting like this. So one of them is angled backwards. So that gives it the 3D look. There's one lamp, one shade that's sort of flat against the viewer's view. And then, but then one goes back to the side because it's kind of a square lamp. So we're just seeing a little bit of that one side. Now I'm doing the gray highlights. Now, anything, if you know anything about painting and if you've painted much at all, or even a little bit, you know that more than one shade of a color is always good, a good idea to make an object look more like three-dimensional rather than two-dimensional. So I decided to put the light coming from the right side. It doesn't really have to. In fact, as I look at my shadows, really I should have put it coming, put it on the left. I don't worry about it. Putting highlights on the top of the lamp really helps the eye start to see, oh, so it's the front pane that's nice and flat. And then the one that goes back, you can tell that that, that, that angle and you can see because of the highlights that I'm putting on where those 
sections are in space and it really becomes more 3D with the highlights. Almost no highlights on the side that goes back, but a lot more on the front side. And as you see, I'm even lightening those highlights on the front side. So now, in our nice Christmassy sort of winter scene, there's going to be snow that fell recently, and it's going to it will stick to the top edges of things. So I'm just overloading Baby Bear with lots of white, pure white paint, no water added. In fact, I I wiped off Baby Bear first so that there was no water in with the paint whatsoever, and I'm just kind of dabbing those clumps of snow on the top of the lamp, on any edge that you would know would be facing upwards and would snow would land on um, at the base of the lamp as well. And then in the crooks of the trees, or if you want, if, if you, or if you like the crotch of the tree <laughs> branches. So when two tree branches kind of, one comes out of the other, it forms this kind of crotch. <laughs> and I stick some snow in there. So, that takes a little while, so let's just watch.
I always find with, with paintings like this, as soon as you put the snow sort of covering on those branches, you just, it just feels so marvelous. So while I had snow white on my brush, I thought I'd sort of lighten some of the tops of the drifts, snow drifts on the bottom of the painting, just for more dramatic effect. And I'm just going on like, like where I would see a snow drift and along the tops and bringing some more drama. So now I added water to the black, some black paint. You can add water to gray paint if you'd rather as well, if you want it to be more subtle than this one. And then I'm just sort of adding a shadow underneath the lamppost because if you don't add a shadow, it always looks like it's floating. So this grounds it in space. And I'm not trying to make it exactly the size, the shape of the lamppost. I sort of roughly will do. And the last step of this painting, I'm just kind of creating some shadows under the snowdrifts, especially the ones that go over into the icy stream, because otherwise they kind of look two dimensional. They look like they're just it's sitting there, and I want to make sure that there's kind of a shadow under each snowdrift on the ice of the pond. I hope you enjoyed painting Winter Wonderland. And I have to tell you, this is, since COVID, my way of, of eventually monetizing my skills as a teacher. Um, I looked at many ways of sort of trying to charge for tickets and that kind of thing, and I really didn't want to do that. So I decided to become a YouTube creator and put these up for free. So I do ask you, though, to buy me a coffee. Because even though you, you see me drinking wine, see it's empty. <laughs> it's always empty, isn't it? Um, you see me drinking wine, but I'm actually a bit of a coffee holic. Actually, drink way more, way infinitesimally more than I drink wine. I drink coffee. So um, I went on this site called Buy Me a Coffee, and so it's a way to just shoot me five bucks if you enjoy the tutorial, uh, and especially if you paint along and you get a painting. Um, then I would, I would love to get your support. Otherwise, liking and subscribing my videos and especially commenting. I love comments. They make my day and I will respond to all of them. So I really, really, really thank you for being here. Cheers, love.